Okay, geometry, here we go into the beginning of chapter eight. And I have good news for you guys. Your life is going to get much easier this year compared to other years in the regard that there's a lot of stuff that we normally cover at the beginning of section 8.1 that we've decided this year with most of us being remote still, we are not gonna be doing. And that is basically the idea of simplifying radicals. So I am gonna walk through this just real quick. We're gonna be talking a lot about radicals, which you guys probably know better by the name of a square root sign. So when we ask an ex uh, a question like example A here, we would read this as what is the square root of 49? And the real question we're asking here is what number squared or multiplied by itself is going to equal 49? And in all of the examples that I have on this page, all of the radicands, that's the word everybody for the number you are taking the square root of, all of your radicands, including this fraction, and then these monomial expressions, those are all what we call perfect squares, meaning that there's a nice, clean, rational answer to the question being asked. So the square root of 49, everybody, is seven. Why? That is because seven squared or to the second power is equal to 49. So an important thing to understand everybody is that squares and square roots are inverse operations of one another. Now in an algebra class, we would normally put a plus or minus in front of that seven right there. Technically, positive seven squared equals 49, but so does negative seven. If you were to take negative seven and multiply it by itself, negative seven times negative seven, that would get you positive 49 as well. So this is technically correct. There are two answers algebraically to the question of what's the square root of 49. But in geometry, since everything we're dealing with here is going to represent the length of a side or maybe the measure of an angle, negative answers don't really make a whole lot of sense. So we're going to say quickly that our answer there is just 7. Going right down the list, you take the square root of a fraction by simply taking the square root of the numerator, then the square root of the denominator. So the square root of 25 over 36 is just going to be 5 over 6. When you have a monomial with multiple factors, like 144 times x squared, you simply take the square root of each factor independently of one another. So the square root of 144 is 12. And now this is a little tricky. The square root of x to the sixth, all you do with an exponent, everybody, is cut it in half to make 12x cubed. Now, if you're not sure if that's right, you can check your answer by taking the answer, 12x cubed, and multiplying it by itself, 12x cubed. And when we do that, the 12 times 12 gets us 144, and the x cubed times the x cubed, remember everybody that when we are multiplying monomials, we add their exponents together and get 144x to the sixth. So yeah, that answer of 12x cubed is correct. Okay, and with that in mind, the last one should go pretty quickly as well. The square root of 225 is 15. I'm hoping you guys have that one memorized. The square root of a to the 10th is a. And for the power, you just take the 10 and cut it in half to get a to the fifth. And likewise, for the square root of b to the 16th, you take half of that 16 and get b to the eighth. Okay, okay. All right, so with that in mind, everybody, that's just a quick run through of simplifying radicals. Now, in a lot of what we're gonna be doing later on in this chapter, uh, including today here, you're gonna end up with a question like E, where you're trying to take the square root of a number that is not a perfect square. So in normal years, we would tell you, and I'm gonna go through this very, very quickly, to split that 50 up into a 25 times two. Now, why 25 times two and not, say, five times 10? Because 25 is a special number called a perfect square. And your list of perfect squares, everybody, I'm just gonna write them down very quickly as we're talking about them here. Your list of perfect squares are numbers that have integer square roots. So you'll notice all of these numbers that I'm writing down, I'm hoping you guys recognize them, you can take the square root of any one of these numbers without having to get your hands dirty. Okay, what do I mean by that? Oh, I don't know, the square root of 64? Well, that's nice and easy, that's eight. The square root of 81? That's nine. The square root of one? 
is 1. And this list goes on and on. So I'm going to list just a few more. 13 squared is 169. 14 squared is 196. 15 squared is 225. 16 squared is 256. 17 squared is 289. 18 squared is 324. 361, 400. It goes on and on and on and on. But that's probably as much as we would ever need to know. And now you would use a property of radicals that says you can break this up into the square root of 25 times the square root of 2 and the square root of 25 is 5. You can't do anything with the square root of 2, so that's your answer. The square root of 50, put in simple radical form, is 5 times the square root of 2. But lucky for you guys, we're not going to do simple radical form this year, and we are going to allow you guys to just use a calculator and type a number in, the square root of 50, and then here you go. Your directions for each problem will tell you how to round it, if I had said to round this number to the nearest tenth, the answer would be 7.1. If I'd said to the nearest hundredth, two decimal places, 7.07. .07. And if I had said to the nearest thousandth, which is three places, 7.071. Okay, so we'll get into that, but for now, I'm going to go to the nearest hundredth and say 7.07. .07. So I will use this little symbol right here that means approximately equal to, and we'll do that one. Uh, square root of 24, well, the only thing I know, 24 is in between these two perfect squares of 16 and 25. The square root of 16 is 4. The square root of 25 is 5. So I know that this number, as a decimal, has to be somewhere between 4 and 5. But since 24 is so close to 25, I'm thinking that my decimal is going to be much closer to 5 than it is to 4. So let's try that. The square root of 24, there we go. Rounding to the nearest hundredth again, this is a good one. Let me write that down here and we'll talk about it. 4.898. Let me write that down. And I know that's more places than I need. 4.898. And there was more after it, but all I really care about, if the directions say to round to the nearest hundredth, that's this place right here. So we look at the next digit. That's why nothing that comes after that 8 is important. And if that digit right there is a 5 or anything higher, this number rounds up. Now the only problem is, there is no digit higher than 9. So I would look at this as a 2-digit number, 89. And with this number being an 8, I would round that 89 up to 90 and make that 4.90 as a number rounded to the nearest hundredth. Okay, um, not worried about that and not worried about that. So here we go, everybody, on to the real stuff of the day. Theorem 8.1, everybody, one of the most, uh, certainly probably the most famous theorem in all of geometry is the Pythagorean theorem. And I'm pretty sure you guys have learned this in previous math classes, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper into it here in high school geometry, and hopefully you're going to learn a little bit more than you have in the past. Now this is the long wordy version of the Pythagorean theorem that you're probably not going to want to memorize, and that's fine. It says that the sum of the squares of the legs of a right triangle is equal to the square of its hypotenuse. We probably better talk about a little bit of vocab here real quick, everybody, because we haven't done this since back in chapter four. In a right triangle, which is a right triangle, it's called that because it has one right angle here, the side that is opposite from the right angle has a special name, and that is called the hypotenuse. And that's probably one of the only times you'll see me write out the whole word hypotenuse. We usually just abbreviate it as HYP. The other two sides, the ones that meet at the right angle, those are called the legs of a right triangle. Okay, so every right triangle has three sides. One hypotenuse, which is located across from the right angle, and then two legs. So what does the Pythagore uh, Pythagorean theorem say? It says the sum of the squares of the legs. Stop right there. One of your legs is A. So the square of that leg is a squared. That's not what I wanted to do. There you go. Sum means that we're going to add. The other leg here is b, and its square is b squared. So the sum of the squares of the legs of a right triangle is equal to, so pretty obviously that's where I got the equal sign from, the square of its hypotenuse. 
So in this diagram, the hypotenuse was C, and the square of the hypotenuse is C squared. And that is where this version of the Pythagorean theorem comes from. And this is what 99% of the world knows and memorizes and regurgitates for what the Pythagorean theorem is. If you were to ask a person who hasn't been in a math class in 20 years what the Pythagorean theorem says, there's a decent chance they might tell you a squared plus b squared equals c squared. However, I do need to caution you guys about one thing. That particular formula is only relevant if we use the traditional method of naming a right triangle. And the way that that method works is that each of the three sides of the right triangle is named after its opposite angle. What do I mean by that? If this little leg over here is little a, then the angle across from little a would have to be point a, or capital A there. If this leg down here is little b, then the angle across from that would have to be capital B. And for the hypotenuse to be little c, I'll go the other way with this one as well, your right angle would have to be point c. Now, if you do it that way, and the important thing here, guys, is that C must be the right angle, then this version of the Pythagorean theorem will always work for you. But I actually like this version a little bit better because it makes you think and it will get you the correct answer more often. You're less likely to make a silly mistake if you can remember leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. That slows you down just a little bit, and it makes you think about whether or not, uh, you know, one particular side here uh, is a leg or a hypotenuse. Okay, so with that in mind, everybody, let's start doing a couple problems here. Um, excuse me, actually, we're not going to get there yet. I wanted to talk for just a moment here, and I wanted to make this, everybody, uh, a high school geometry class as opposed to a middle school one. Let's talk about this favorite word of everybody's here, this proof of the Pythagorean theorem. And I do want to clarify, this is just one of many. There are a lot of different proofs that exist uh, for the Pythagorean theorem, but this is one that I'm hoping we can understand. Now, unfortunately, this particular proof uses a theorem that we didn't talk about earlier in the year, but it does do something that I'm hoping you guys can understand. If we look at this triangle, this diagram that I started with right here, we started off with triangle, and I'm looking at the big one now, guys, triangle A, B, C. And then what we did is we drew, and I just realized something I forgot to label here, we drew what's called an altitude from the right angle, C, to the hypotenuse. Uh, and that piece right there we typically call H for height. And when we did that, we've cut the big triangle up into three, or I should say into two smaller triangles, and all of them are similar to each other. Triangle ABC, the big triangle, is similar, going back to chapter seven now, to triangle, let me think about that for just a second, to triangle A, and then C, and then D. This little triangle right over here is similar to the big outer triangle here as well. They're the same shape, they're just different sizes. And furthermore, there's another triangle over here. This would be kind of the middle size triangle that is similar as well. And naming that one in order, let's see here, guys, it's the bigger acute angle, so that would be C, followed by the smaller acute angle, which is B, followed by the right angle here, which is D. Those three triangles are all similar to each other. And given that fact, let me get rid of this junk right here, and let me call this piece here H again. Hmm, let's see if I remember one of the theorems here from chapter 7 that unfortunately, guys, we didn't use this year. But here's what it said. It said that the leg, I'm trying to do uh, proportions of, uh, of corresponding sides here, everybody. So let's see. It said that a leg of the original right triangle, which I'm going to focus on A right here, is the geometric mean, so it goes here twice, between the entire hypotenuse. Now, I didn't label this, and I should have, guys. The entire hypotenuse of the original right triangle goes from A to B. Now, you'll notice that X makes up this little piece from A to D. Y makes up this little piece right here. So this is going to be C the hypotenuse of the entire triangle that goes from there to there. 
So that leg A is the geometric mean between the entire hypotenuse, which is C, and the piece of the hypotenuse adjacent to that, which is Y. Basically, guys, if I'm looking at the little triangle here, yeah, this ratio of long leg to hypotenuse is equal to the same ratio in the larger outer triangle, where the longer leg of the whole triangle is A and the hypotenuse of the whole thing is C. I don't think that's going to make a ton of sense to you guys, but I'm going to ask you to believe me on that. Okay, now I'm going to cross multiply. A times A is going to get us A squared, and Y times C is just going to get us CY. I'm going to leave that right there. Now I'm going to do the same thing with the smaller triangle up here. Okay, um, that one, let's see, we're going to have now instead of A being used twice, B is going to get used twice. And that's the geometric mean between the entire hypotenuse, which is C, and in this case, instead of a Y, that's going to be an X. Again, I'm going to ask you guys to trust me on that one. We cross multiply and get a B squared is equal to, and an X times C is going to be CX. Okay, so where are we now, everybody? Now that we've got these two statements right here, which at least in theory then are going to end up being true, where are we going? Both of these two expressions that we have contain a C. So what I'm going to do is try to solve them both for C here by dividing by a Y on both sides. And here I'm going to get C by itself by dividing by X on both sides. So what does that do for me? The Y's cancel and we get C is equal to an A squared over Y. And here the X's cancel. We get C is equal to a B squared over X. Okay, so where are we now, everybody? If these two expressions are both solved for C, then these two expressions here, that one and that one, since they're both equal to C, have to be equal to each other. So we're going to get A squared over Y must be equal to b squared over x. Okay, so that's a statement here in red now that we know is true as well. And how is that getting us towards a relationship right here uh, for the Pythagorean theorem? Well, let's see what we can do with this one. I'm going to cross multiply here again because proportions are kind of ugly. And we're going to get a squared multiplied by x is equal to b squared multiplied by y. Okay, where next? Um, eventually, I'd like to get a squared and b squared on the opposite side. 